Well, good morning, everybody. You guys doing all right this morning? Good. You're here, and that's a start, right? Hope you guys got your coffee or your tea or your Red Bull, whatever it takes to get you going in the morning. I'm glad you're here. And, uh, man, I'm excited and honored to be able to share with you guys this morning. We're going to jump into God's Word for a little bit. Before we do, last Sunday, some of you, those of you who were here, you know that two cool things happened here at Faith Family. Number one, we got free popsicles and snow cones after service, so that was fun. I don't know about you guys, but um, I know snow cones are just a big cup of sugary ice, but I felt totally justified eating that last week because that's how hot it is here in South Texas, right? I felt like we deserved that, right? So uh, I, I enjoyed it. Honestly, I was, uh, I was tempted to get one after both services, but... <laughs> I thought leading worship up here with green teeth would have, would have kind of been a bad look. So that was my accountability. But we had fun, so much fun. The other thing that happened last week is Pastor Jim started a new series. Uh, we started a series called In the Middle. And we're talking about moving from chaos into beauty. And I love that because I'm willing to bet that all of us at some point we experience chaos, right? I got to experience some chaos to start my week this week. And I thought, man, thank you, God, for helping me to relate to everyone this Sunday. Now, it really wasn't that bad. Let's just say that we are having some sleep regression in the Graf household, our little ones. So you guys can keep us in prayer. And if I say anything crazy today, I figure we can just blame it on lack of sleep. Is that all right with you guys? So, um, but I'm willing to bet that on some level, we've all found ourselves in the middle of chaos. But God wants to help move us into something beautiful and how we handle ourselves in the middle of the chaos has a lot to say about how that happens in our lives. So Pastor Jim kicked it off last week. He talked about how God is the savior of shattered souls and he talked about how we can experience God's salvation when we find ourselves in the middle of struggle and brokenheartedness and it was a super encouraging message. So if you weren't here, if you didn't get to, to watch it or hear it, I'd encourage you to check it out on our website or check it out um, on uh, YouTube. It was a great message. And today we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about breaking what binds us. Everybody say breaking what binds us. Now what exactly does that mean? Well, the word bind basically means to make something bound, right? And bound means what? It means to be restricted, to be limited, to be confined, right? Anybody here earthbound? Where are my white people at? Come on, you can't jump? Just kidding. <laughs> earthbound, it means you're stuck, you're stuck, you're confined to the ground, right? You can't get up. Or uh, the word boundaries, right? Boundaries, they put limits on us, right? So today we're going to be talking about how we can find breakthrough in the things that the enemy is trying to use to limit us from being all that God has created us to be. Did you know that God has a plan for you? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God has a plan to prosper you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. He wants to use you to further his kingdom here on earth. But we can very easily find ourselves getting stuck in certain areas of our lives, right? I heard this funny story about three girls. They got stranded on a deserted island and they were stuck. There was a, a brunette, a redhead, and a blonde. And uh, from this island, they could see that there was some land across the ocean. And they knew if they could get to this land, they would be saved. They could get help. So the brunette said, you know what, I'll, I'll go first. I'll, I'll try to get over there. So she started to swim. She was swimming. She got about a quarter of the way there. And she stopped. And she could see that she was about a quarter of the way to the land. And she thought, man, I'm already so tired. There's no way I'll make it the rest of the way. So she turned around and she swam back. So the redhead said, okay, well, I'll give it a try. And so she started to swim, and she got a quarter of the way there. She was doing good. She got a third of the way there. She stopped. She could see she was only a third of the way there, so she uh, thought, man, I'm, I'm too tired. There's no way I'll make it. So she turned around, and she swam back. Then the blonde went. She started swimming. She got a quarter of the way there. She was doing good. She got a third of the way there. She was doing good. She got halfway there, and she stopped. And she could see she was only halfway there, and she thought to herself, Man, I'm halfway there. There's no way I can make it the rest of the way. So she turned around and, and swam back. <laughs> Some of you guys will get that after service. You can ask your neighbor. <laughs> That's a really, really dumb story and truly doesn't really have anything to do with my message very much. But have you ever found yourself stuck? Have you ever found 
uh, had something in your life that was holding you down, something that is keeping you from being everything you know God has created to be, and you just can't seem to beat it. As I'm saying that, I bet there's something that comes to mind. Maybe you battle lust. You don't know why. Maybe it's just something that you've battled your entire life, and it doesn't even have to be physical lust. Maybe you just can't ever have enough in any area of your life, and it's taking its toll. It's limiting you. I believe this message can be for you this morning. Maybe you battle addiction, and sure, drugs and alcohol, those are big ones, but addiction can take many forms, right? Maybe there's just something that you can't let go of, and you know it's taking its toll. It's limiting you. I believe this message is for you this morning. Or maybe you're the kind of person everybody would say, man, you're such a great person. You're so nice to everybody. But the truth is you're so scared of disappointing people that you're saying yes to too many of the wrong things. You're so worried with what everyone else thinks about you that you spend your time concerned about pleasing others rather than pleasing God. I believe this message is for you this morning. See, my point is this, there's not just one thing, there's not just one sin that binds us, right? So this message is for all of us this morning, and here's what I want to do. I want to look at three stories in the Bible where we see people who were bound, who were stuck, who were in tough situations, but they were able to find breakthrough. And I want to look at these stories, and I want to ask ourselves, what can we learn from these people? What can we learn from these stories? I know I'm in a room full of people who love the Bible and who appreciate the Bible. There's so many awesome stories in the Bible, so many great truths that God gave us to help us. So let's jump into the first one, all right? This is the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. Many of us know this story. We'll pick it up in John chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, The teacher of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Now, to be clear, it did not say she was being accused of adultery. It says that she had been caught in the act. That's pretty bad, right? How many of you guys would not want to be that lady in that moment? We're about to have a Jerry Springer moment go down in John chapter 8, right? (laughs) She's about to be put on blast. And guess what? She's guilty, right? And, you know, in these times in the Jewish community, adultery was a... Was, was treated as a very big deal, right? You're going to see here in just a minute that they, they threatened to possibly stone and kill her. So we pick it up in verse 4. It says, they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? It says they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again, and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again, and he wrote in the dust, and we don't know what he wrote. The Bible simply doesn't say, but scholars speculate that maybe he wrote the Ten Commandments. Maybe he wrote, you know, some sins. Maybe he wrote some some people's names in the sands. We don't know, but what we know is verse 9 says this, when the accusers heard this, They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus looked at her and he said, neither do I. Now, get a little emotional reading the end of that story because put yourself in the shoes of that woman that day. She was caught in the act of adultery. She was probably embarrassed humiliated. She was probably scared being marched down to the temple knowing, you know, that, that, I mean, her life could be over, right? She was probably expected to be met with condemnation, with dirty looks, with snickers. But what happened? Not the good kind of snickers, actually. I said that and some of y'all's head went with me. She probably, let's redo that. You ready for, here we go. Probably would have been met with condemnation, with dirty looks, right? But here she is standing there, and what is she met with? She's met with love and compassion, the way Jesus treated her. Can you imagine how she must have felt in that moment? And here's the first thing that I want us to look at today. If we're going to find breakthrough, if we're going to break what binds us, we need to understand that freedom starts with forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. 
Jesus probably could have condemned that lady right then and there, right? And nobody would have batted an eye, but he didn't. Why? Because Jesus came so we can be forgiven. Jesus came so that we don't have to be defined by our past. But so often we struggle to accept that, don't we? The other day I, I told you guys about how I ran into someone that I had known for a really long time. And they were telling me a little bit about their, their story and how their life had panned out. And I could hear from them such regret at some of the decisions that they had made. I could hear from them that they had just kind of accepted that this is where their life was now because of who they had been. And I could just tell that they weren't fulfilled and they hadn't forgiven themselves. They were allowing their past to define their future. And maybe, you know, you've made some big mistakes in life. Maybe you think there's no way God could ever be good to someone like me. Maybe you thought you'd be a lot further along in life at this point in your life. and You just can't seem to forgive yourself for all the time that you feel like you've wasted. Maybe you've hurt people. And maybe you genuinely believe that you deserve to suffer for the rest of your days. But let me tell you this morning, Jesus came so you could be forgiven. It's important to it. Yeah, amen. We need to hear that. We need to know that. Jesus knew we'd need to know that. It's important to him. And then he came so we could be forgiven. If we deny him of that forgiveness, who are we to deny him, right? He came so we could be forgiveness. And the moment we can grasp that, the moment we can live in forgiveness, we can take steps towards freedom. Now, you guys are probably going to hear a lot of stories about my kids because I've had stories told about me all my life, and people ask me, like, shouldn't you be a little more compassionate because you've been there? And I thought, no, I'm more understanding of why I had so many stories told about me, you know. So I think God gives us kids to give us some good examples. So I love my kids. They're, they're amazing, and they're a lot of fun. And so I know that you guys are going to hear a lot of stories. But my son Copeland, he is um, three years old, and he started to take interest in baseball which if you know my family, we love baseball, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, we're not going to force him, but we'll take him to some games and just see if he, you know, see if he takes the hook. So he loves it. And we bought him a little Nerf bat, a Nerf ball the other day, and we started just playing catch a little bit. And then he said, Daddy, I want to I wanna hit. So I said, all right. I gave him the bat. And if you know Copeland, he's very particular. He knows how he wants things, right? He wants things a certain way. He wants things to be perfect. And he doesn't want to mess up. That's how he is, all right? So I was going to give him his, his first pitch, and he was getting ready to hit. He doesn't really hit, you know, like this yet. He's kind of tomahawking it like this. So I threw him his first pitch, and he swings. And, of course, he misses it, right, which is fine. But he did not like that at all. He was like, I can't hit it. I don't want to do this. And I looked at him. I said, Bubba, it's okay. I said, Daddy still misses the ball. And he was like, no, I, I don't want to do it. I was like, let's try it again. He's like, I can't do it. Eventually he did it, and he's doing great. But, but in that moment, he didn't want to swing anymore. And I thought, isn't that how we are in life sometimes? We make mistakes, and we think, man, this is just who I am. We mess up, and we think, well, I might as well not keep moving forward. I might as, not try, might as well not try. I'm done. Right? But, man, Jesus came so we could be forgiven. Jesus came so we can grab that bat and we can keep swinging and we can keep moving forward. Amen? Amen. So we have to learn that, man, Jesus came so we could be forgiven. But there's more to forgiveness than just, you know, forgiving ourselves, right? Some of us here this morning, we're, uh, we, we might really relate to that lady who, who we're talking about. We need to receive forgiveness. Some of us this morning, if we're honest with ourselves, we might be more like the Pharisees. See, it's humbling to think that these Pharisees, man, they had devoted their lives to being godly men, to being godly people. And here they were standing in the presence of the Son of God, but they were too concerned with this woman's sin to even recognize it. See, if we're not careful, we can be blinded by our own unforgiveness. Luke 6, 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be what? Forgiven. Amen. Freedom starts with forgiveness. There's one more lesson I think we can learn from this story. I want to go back just to verse 10 real quick because there's a little more to the story. It says, Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. 
Then he said this, go and sin no more. You know, the second thing we need to understand if we're going to find breakthrough is that freedom is found through obedience. Say obedience. You know, God cares so much about you that he left a book full of truths to help guide you in life, right? It's called the Bible. And I'd encourage you guys in your own time to read the rest of John chapter 8 because it's a great story. Jesus shows the importance of forgiveness, but then he goes on to preach an amazing sermon. And in this sermon, um, some of our well-known scriptures come out of this sermon, but basically what he does, he shows forgiveness, right? But then he goes on to talk to the people about the power of sin. Jesus isn't in any way trying to minimize sin. Sin has a price, right? It hurts us. It hurts the people around us. And God's forgiveness shouldn't be used as a pass to sin as we please. See, Jesus didn't want to just remove the condemnation of sin. Jesus wanted to remove the power that sin was holding over their lives. So he wanted to teach them to find freedom. He wanted to teach them to break what's binding them. So... We're going to jump in at verse 31. It says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free. What will set you free? The truth, right? How do we know the truth? He said, if you remain faithful to my teachings, obedience leads to freedom. Verse 34, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, everyone who is a slave, is, I'm sorry, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Jesus is saying sin will enslave us, but obedience will set us free. Now let's be honest, sometimes obedience isn't easy, Right? Sometimes there are things that God asks of us that aren't easy. Sometimes, you know, we can say, God, I hear what you're, what you're wanting me to do, but I think I have a better idea, right? Let me do it my way. Now, I'm going to tell one more story on my son Copeland, all right? You guys may know this already, but Copeland loves the drums. He's been playing drums since he was months old, played his first beat when he was like a year and a half, and now he's three years old, and he could kind of play along with songs and everything, but I'm wanting to kind of start instilling some fundamentals in them, right, to help them really be able to play um, intentionally and stuff. So we went out to the drum set the other day, and I sat down at the drums, and I told Copeland, I said, "Um, Copeland, let me teach you how to play the drums. And he looked at me, and he said, no, Daddy, let me teach you how to play the drums. (laughs) He's confident, all right? And that's how we can be in life sometimes, right? God, I hear what you're saying to me, but I think I want to try it my way. God, what you're asking me seems difficult, and is it really necessary? Because I think I want to do it this way, right? But Jesus said, if you remain faithful to my teachings, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom starts with forgiveness. Freedom is found through obedience. Now, let's look at our second story this morning. This is a story in Genesis chapter 50. It's the story of Joseph. Many of you know the story of Joseph. Let me give you a quick kind of paraphrase, Joseph was one of 12 sons born to Jacob, and he had a lot of favor with his dad. Um, He he also had a dream that he shared with his brothers. It was a dream that really was a prophecy about how his brothers would, would bow down to him at one point. I don't think his brothers liked that dream very much, and there was a lot of envy and jealousy towards Joseph from his brothers. So one day they went out when they were in the field And they sold Joseph into slavery. They told his dad he had died. So Joseph found himself a slave in Egypt. Continued to serve God, but he was falsely accused of something while he was a slave and he was thrown in prison. I'm sure Joseph was thinking to himself at this point, how in the world did I end up here? How am I supposed to accomplish the the dreams that God placed in my heart from here? But he continued to serve God and God ends up opening doors and creating favor with the Pharaoh. And and Joseph goes from being this prisoner to being number two in command in all of Egypt. God uses him. And and so he's reunited with his brothers. He shows forgiveness. But then his father passes away. And his brothers are worried that maybe now that dad's gone, you know, Joseph is going to come for vengeance. So we'll pick it up in Genesis 50. And as we do, I want us to look and see 
the perspective that we can learn. Joseph's outlook that caused him to go from all these horrible places that he was in to still being able to be used by God in such a mighty way. Genesis 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs that they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And this is a scripture I want us to look at, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Here's number three. Freedom happens when our butt is bigger than our blame. Say, my butt is bigger than my blame. Now, I'm not trying to be funny this morning, all right? I'm not trying to be clever. I'm not just trying to talk about big butts in my sermon, all right? That just happened. But I honestly, I didn't know a, a more effective way to communicate this, a more effective way to say this. And let me show you what I'm talking about. And Joseph said, you intended to harm me. And many of us, we get stuck at that point in the sentence. 20 years, 30 years, sometimes our whole lives. Sometimes we never finish the sentence. Well, this person hurt me. Well, this happened to me, and that's why I am the way that I am. If my family would have been better to me, if my boss wouldn't have fired me, if this bad thing wouldn't have happened to me, I wouldn't be where I am today. And don't you think Joseph had every opportunity to blame somebody? He had every opportunity to blame something. But what did he say? He said, but God. Some of us need to be reminded this morning, you may have been wronged, but God. You may be going through it, but God. You may feel like you have every reason to throw in the towel, but God. Let your but be bigger than your blame, amen? But God intended it for good. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that God causes everything to work for the good of those who love God and is called according to his purposes, but God. Are you guys with me this morning? I hope you're being encouraged, man, because I believe there are going to be chains broken this morning. Some of you guys, man, you've battled that thing long enough, and I believe you're going to find breakthrough this morning. Let's look at our next story, all right? This is our last story. It's the story of Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel. They had the call of God on them to share the gospel, and they were traveling, and they found themselves getting thrown in prison. And I'm sure they were probably thinking to themselves, how are we supposed to share the gospel? How are we supposed to fulfill our purpose sitting in this prison cell? So we'll look at Acts 16, verse 23. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. I don't know about you, but I, I wouldn't really like being severely flogged and put in prison, right? That wasn't a good day. It says, when he received the orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to him. You never know who's listening to you, right? Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison began to shake. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Here's number four. Freedom is unleashed through praise and prayer. Here's another way to say it. Your praise breaks chains. Come on, say, my praise, my praise. breaks chains. You guys believe that this morning? And see, so you may find yourself in a difficult situation, but let me remind you, your praise breaks chains. You may see no way this estranged relationship could ever be mended, but let me remind you, your praise breaks chains. You may feel so stuck that you could never see a way out, but let me, uh, let me remind you, your praise breaks chains. Whenever you don't know what to do, praise. Whenever you don't know what to do, worship. Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne room of grace, that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in our time of need. Why is this so important? Hey, sometimes we need to remind ourselves how big our God is, right? Sometimes we need our faith to be lifted. Sometimes we need to remember to invite God into our situation. And Paul and Silas, they were praising because they knew that their praise could break chains. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat, he would send out worshipers in front of his armies. Why? Because he knew that their praise broke chains. So quickly this morning, how do we break what binds us? Put up my recap slide real quick. Number one, freedom starts with what? Forgiveness. Number two, freedom is found through obedience. Everybody say obedience. And here's your favorite one. Freedom happens when our butt is bigger than our blame. And number four, freedom is unleashed through praise and prayer. Amen. Can I pray for you this morning? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for every single person here this morning. God, I thank you, Lord, that you want to move us from chaos into beauty. God, you want to use our chaos even to create something beautiful. So, Father, I just thank you, God, that there is breakthrough happening in this place today. God, there are people who have struggled with things for so long, God, but they're going to find breakthrough, Father. God, I thank you, Lord, that as we continue to put you first, Father, as we continue to live in obedience, Father, God, you're going to lead us into the beautiful things that you have for us. God, I thank you that every single person here, God, you have a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says a plan to prosper us, to give us a hope, to give us a future. So we receive that today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. amen. Let's give God a hand of praise. He's a good God. And we want to do one more thing, something we do every week, and it's, one of the, it's the most important thing we do every week. So if you guys would bow your head and close your eyes for me. I want to pray for a group of people here today. If you're here today and you think, you know, I've never really given my heart to God. I hear you talking about him, how he has a plan for me, but I don't have a relationship with him. And if, if I died today, I don't even know if I would go to heaven. If that's you this morning, I would love to pray for you because the Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That word anyone means every single one of us. So if you would like to say that prayer, if you'd like to say, man, I want to make sure I'm going to heaven and I want to make God the Lord of my life, if that's you, I would love the opportunity to pray with you this morning. So if on the count of three, if you would just lift your hand, nobody looking around, every, you know, head bowed and eye closed. I just want to know who I'm praying with this morning. If that's you, you'd like to give your heart to Jesus today, just ask you to lift your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Amen, I see those hands. Thank you, God. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, God loves you. He wants to be good to you. I see those hands. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, I've, I've said that prayer. I've given my heart to Jesus before, but the truth is, kind of been like what you've talked about. I've kind of wanted to do it my own way for a while, but I know that his way is better. And I want to return to him today. If that's you, I would love to say a prayer for you if you would just... Throw your hand up on the count of three. One, two, three. Nobody looking around. Say, I want to return to Jesus today. Amen. I see those hands. Amen. Well, I want to say a prayer. And if you would, if you would repeat after me, let's say it with our, with our mouths, but let's pray it from our heart this morning. All right. Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus. I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And that's why you sent Jesus. So today, I make you my Lord. I thank you that I'm forgiven, that I'm loved, and that I'll never be the same. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give it up for everyone who said that prayer this morning. Listen, if you said that prayer, we've, we know from our own experience, man, that that's the best decision that we could ever make in life. And just like any relationship, you know, it's, it's a journey and it's a process to be able to really get to know God and know all that he has for you. So we want to help make that 
easy. We want to help be, that for, be there for you every step of the way. So we have a gift for you. On your way out on these tables, there's a white packet. And in there, there's a book from our pastors called 30 Days to a New Beginning. It's going to help you understand the decision that you made. It's going to help you know what next steps to be able to take, to be able to grow your relationship and, and you know, experience everything that God has for you. So we'd love for you to grab that on your way out. We also want to encourage you to be baptized. Jesus said, believe and be baptized. Baptism is the first opportunity we have to show obedience to Jesus once we're saved. And when we go under that water in the baptistry, we're saying, man, we know our old life is behind. The old me is gone and you're coming up a new creation in Jesus. So we would love to be able to celebrate baptism with you. So they're going to put um, something on the screen with just some instructions. If you'd like to, to sign up to be baptized, you can do it in like 30 seconds and then we'll be able to, to, get, to help you get, get signed up to be able to do that. So real quick, Pastor Jim is about to come and say the blessing, but they're going to throw that up on the screen. If you'd like to be baptized, you can do so. You can fill that out. All right. Faith family, let's give it up for them. Let's give Pastor Michael a great hand for working hard. Amen. <laughs> Fed us the word well this morning. And you know what, guys? Jesus' words are so life-changing, aren't they? They're just flat-out life-changing. We can trust them. I don't know who you've had lie to you, but God's not a man that he would ever lie. And so let's let this sink deep in our soul. First of all, that God... The Holy Spirit wants to do things about those shattered places in our heart. We learned how last week. If you missed the message, you can go on our YouTube channel. You can go on the website. And then today, God can help you break free. Everybody say break free. We can break free of those binding experiences if we'll remember to choose compassion from God and forgiveness, not condemnation for our past. If we will make a decision that we're going to let God be in control Instead of holding on to control ourselves, if we'll let God's big butt be bigger than our blame. How, how do you like it that way, huh? God always has a butt. And I'll tell you, I, I've battled blame. I've battled bitterness in my heart. And it's freeing to none but God. But God, amen? And then to choose praise and prayer over panic. I, I'm looking at some people who are going to break free this morning. Can you say Amen. Man, that, 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 that word fed my heart this morning. Well, hey, I want to encourage you that this week we have Vacation Bible School. Everybody say VBS. Yes. Does anybody know when VBS was started for the first time? Anybody? I do because Google is my friend. And he is so smart. And I learned that VBS happened first in 1894, y'all. Same century that baseball, basketball, and football were created. VBS is right there with them. I love all four of them. Amen. Right? And uh, for something to stick around that long, it must be good. And I've seen the benefit of VBS in the hearts of kids. God does big things in the hearts of kids at VBS. And, hey, can we give all of our workers that are going to invest and love kids this week and pour God's work. Can we give them a big hand in advance, Right? I want to remind you, too, we'll have prayer partners down front if you uh, desire prayer after service. And if you'll stand to your feet, I want to speak this blessing over you this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and bring you peace. Thank you for honoring God and being in his house today. Amen. Amen.